What will you learn in first aid safety? We'll give you an introduction to first aid, tell you what the contents of a first aid kit should be, a minimum requirement, give you a hazard analysis to build a first aid kit, tell you about first aid problems and solutions, when to call for help, who are your first aid trained personnel, and how to best summon help. Introduction to First Aid Kit. Rule number one is get all the help you can for first aid injuries, no matter how small those injuries first appear. It is very important for you to get immediate treatment for every injury, regardless how small you think that injury is. A basic first aid kit is designed for normal, low-risk work situations. Here are the contents of a basic first aid kit. We'll add one absorbent compress, 4 by 8 inches, 16 adhesive bandages, 1 by 3 inches, one adhesive tape, 5 yards long, 10 antiseptic single-use packages, 6 burn treatment single-use packages, and eye coverings for two eyes. We'll also add one eye wash, that is one fluid ounce, four sterile pads, three by three, two pairs of medical exam gloves, one triangular bandage, 39 by 39 by 55. And remember, always use medical exam gloves when exposed to blood or other bodily fluids to help prevent the spread of blood-borne pathogens.
hazard assessment in the workplace. When you as an employer complete your hazard assessment for your work sites, you should assess the hazards for the types and quantities of supplies for your first aid kit. Remember, always use medical gloves when exposed to, exposed to blood or other body parts. Here's some following information to provide you with some ideas for developing your first aid kit. Assessing your potential first aid injury potential begins with checking your surroundings for potential hazards. As you can see from this example, we have snakes, spiders, potentially infectious animals. Your potential hazards versus first aid kit consideration starts with fall, fall hazards working from ladders or unknown terrain, which would need triangular ba bandages, ammonia inhalants, a thermal space blanket for shock, an arm or wire splint. Other potential hazards you may encounter are sunburn, which of course would use sunblock or burn cream, biting or stinging insects, which would require sting kill wipes, bee wasp spray, or meat tenderizer, sprains, which would utilize elastic bandages or cold packs. Also included in our list of hazards would be snake bites, requiring a snake bite kit, poison ivy, which would require calamine lotion, poison oak, which would also require calamine lotion, cuts, which could be solved by antiseptic swab, first aid ointments, compresses, elastic tape, scissors, towelettes, antibacterial wash, rubber gloves, and tweezers.
Electric shock, which required a CPR kit, as well as a thermal space blanket. Frostbite or hypothermia, which could require also a thermal space blanket. Splinters, which requires a first aid forceps as a solution. First aid hazards and solutions include amputation, which will require a plastic garbage bed, dehydration and heat stroke, requiring bottled water, and poisoning during pesticide spraying, which would necessitate an emergency or poison control center. Fractures will require a wooden or plastic splint, one quarter inch by three by 12 to 15 inches, as well as an air inflatable roll or of elastic wrap. Seizures require tongue depressors. Electric shock requires dry, sterile dressing. Chemical burns require dry, sterile dressing and bottled water. Insects in your ear require mineral oil, and burns require flushing with water as well as covering with bandages. Comrades, remember, in many cases have been reported were small, unimportant injuries, such as a splinter wound or a puncture wound, quickly led to an infection. It is important that all of you get immediate treatment for every injury.
Bleeding is the most visible result of an injury. Each of us has five to six quarts of blood in our body. Most people can lose a small amount of blood with no problem. However, a quart or more is lost, it could quickly lead to shock and or death. First aid commandment, treat sh physical shock as quickly as possible, in all cases. One of the best ways to treat bleeding is to place a clean cloth on the wound and apply pressure with the palm of your hand until the bleeding stops. You should also elevate the wound above the victim's heart, if possible, to slow down the rate of ble bleeding. When shock occurs, a major organ or tissue don't get enough oxygen. Shock can often threaten the victim of an injury if not treated quickly. Even if the injury doesn't cause death, the victim can go into shock and die. Shock often occurs when the body's important functions are threatened by not getting enough blood. Never move, to move an injured person unless there is a fire or explosives are involved. The major concern with moving an injured person is the making the injury worse, which is especially true of spinal cord injuries. If you must move an injured person, try to drag him or her by the clothing around the neck or shoulder area. If possible, drag the person onto a blanket or large cloth and then drag that blanket to safety. Perform the Heimlich Maneuver on choking victims. Ask the victim to cough, speak, or breathe. If the victim can do none of these, stand behind the victim, locate the bottom rib with your hand. Ask the victim to cough, speak, or breathe. If the victim can do none of those, of course, locate the bottom rib with your hand and proceed to help the victim. Move your hand across the abdomen to the area above the navel and make a fist. Then place your thumb side on the stomach.
Place your other hand over your fist and press the victim's stomach with a quick upward thrust until the food is dislodged. Flush burns immediately with water whenever possible. Remember the flush to burn first. If the victim's clothing is stuck to the burn, don't try to remove it. Removing clothing that is not stuck to the burn is possible by cutting or tearing it. Cover the burn with clean cotton material. If you do not have any clean cotton material, do not cover the burn with anything. Do not scrub the burn and do not apply any soap, ointment, or home remedy. When administering CPR in the, in, in the case of burn victims, remember, once the victim is stable, begin to run cold water over the burn for a maximum for a minimum of 30 minutes. Next topic is handling heat stroke or heat exhaustion. Use cool treatment for either heat exhaustion or heat stroke. My fellow Americans, remember, heat exhaustion or heat stroke are two different things, although they are commonly confused as the same condition. Heat exhaustion can occur anywhere there is poor air circulation, such as around open furnaces or under heavy equipped machinery, even if the person is poorly adjusted to very warm temperatures. The body reacts by increasing the heart rate and strengthening the blood circulation. Simple heat exhaustion can occur due to loss of body fluids and salts. The symptoms of heat exhaustion are usually excessive fatigue, dizziness, disorientation, and a normal skin temperature, but a damp but clear, clammy feeling.
To treat heat exhaustion, move the victim to a cool spot and encourage drinking cool water and rest. And now a few words about dealing with heat stroke, not to be confused with heat exhaustion. Heat stroke is much more serious and occurs when the body's sweat glands have shut down. Some symptoms of heat stroke are mental confusion, collapse, unconsciousness, and a fever with dry mottled skin. Heat stroke victims will die quickly, so don't wait for medical help to arrive. Assist immediately. The first thing you can do is move the victim to a cool place out of the sun and begin pouring cool water over the victim. Fan the victim to provide good air circulation until medical help arrives. Each form of poisoning has to be handled on an individual basis. The first thing to do is get the victim away from the poison. Then provide treatment appropriate to the type of poisoning. If the poison is a solid form, such as pills, remove it from the victim's mouth by using a clean cloth wrapped around your fingers. If the poison is corrosive to the skin, remove the clothing affected from the area and flush it with water. Try to stay calm when calling the doctor and use the appropriate steps as directed. First Aid Pre-Crisis Planning, Part 5.
Your pre-first aid planning will include doing these steps before a first aid event. Inform your coworkers to get help for any injury or life-threatening situation. Complete a med card so first aiders can know how to handle your specific situation. Update your personal information and emergency contact information at least twice per year. No pre-event planning would be incomplete without knowing any medications that you or your co-workers are taking. Make a list of those items. Know who your CPR people are and keep them well trained. When the event happens, unneeded people need to stay out of the way. Pre-first aid events call for saying it's okay to call 911 more than once. Those not directly involved may need to direct emergency personnel to the location. And remember to inspect the privacy of others. Pre-event planning calls for filling out a med card before an emergency to assist emergency personnel, telling your coworkers about medications that you are taking, filling in your first aid kit with items that address the hazards in your area, knowing who your CPR or first aid personnel are, updating your personal information at least twice per year. Handling emergency calls for handling shock victims only to move when the situation mandates it, immediate action. Not confusing heat stroke with heat exhaustion. Handling each poison incident as a special situation and knowing your poison hotline number. Flushing burn victims first when dealing with burn victims. Asking a pot potential choke victim to talk or speak before applying the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> 